Aloha and welcome back to Politics in Hawaii with Dennis Asaki on Think Tech Hawaii. Today we'll be speaking with Ron Kochi, the State Senate President from Kauai. Ron has been the Kauai County Council Member and its Chairman. He was appointed by the Stuta State Senate by then Governor Lingo when there was a vacancy in 2010, I believe. September 10th, but who's coming? Yeah, in 2003, I actually ran against Ron for a seat on the Island White KIUC Board, or Island Utility Cooperative Board, along with 30, 31 candidates. He came in first, I came in second. He had 138 more votes than me, so we both got in. Well, they they took nine people, so you know. Yeah, they, yeah, yes, I they got it. Comfortably, yeah. comfortably. So I didn't view you as running against yeah, yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, part of the nine that were going to be able to undertake that brand new adventure of the cooperative, which uh, now that we can look back, yeah. almost twenty years later, has become such an incredible success story and. As climate change is featured so much in the news lately, uh, not just here in Hawaii, but globally, uh, you know, the ability of Kauai Island Utility to Cooperative to uh, be pushing at 60% or more renewable, 25% uh, 20, higher than Hawaiian Electric uh, really speaks well for uh, the cooperative and for the people of Kauai. Yeah, thanks for your help in that. That's Ron, why I have my green shirt on today. <laughs> yeah, Ron. Anyway, welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. We, all, we welcome your thoughts on some of the issues facing us in Hawaii. Let's start with uh, political decisions uh, you have to make due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, I, I think the biggest challenge has been in uh, doing the best we can to protect the public health uh, and safety, you need to shut down the movement of people and the activity and interaction of individuals, whether it's visitors or residents. Uh, and that shutdown of activity has, uh, you know, tremendously strong adverse impact on economic activity and there's no threading the needle as we've opened up. Uh, you know, the case count has gone higher. It's just how much higher for quite a while. It was a number that was manageable where, you know, we thought we struck a reasonable balance between having uh, economic activity while uh, still providing, uh, you know, a pretty safe environment, but with the Delta variant, Clearly, it's uh, spreading rapidly, and you know, with the last seven-day average at 500 statewide, as compared to 60 a month ago, and a positivity rate above seven percent when we were a little over two percent just a month ago, just shows how quickly uh, this Delta variant is spreading, and our hospital bed capacity, which was not challenged for the longest time is now being challenged. Yeah, but uh, most of the decisions now is uh, comes from the governor's office and the mayor's, right? Uh, it was a recent emergency power bill limiting the power of the governor, I guess, uh, that he vetoed, but uh, you didn't override it. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, one of the concerns would be exactly what's happening now. We adjourned at the end of April. We did come back in early July for a week to consider a veto overrides or four days. And uh, at, at that point, uh, you know, we went home thinking that, you know, we've got this under control. The average case count, as I said, statewide was about 60, the positivity rate. A little over 2%, the Council of Revenues, uh, you know, was saying that we were in a lot better economic position. You know, we did get the federal assistance. And so our budget was, uh, you know, in a much better place. And now as the Delta variant has uh, quickly 
overtaken us to get the legislature to come back into session to enact laws and to try to deal with uh, what is occurring now. You know, that was one of the concerns that it would just take too many days to try to have the legislature work on something if, uh, you know, it did go quickly and got out of control. And clearly we're in that situation now. And so that factored into not overriding the veto. Um, so actually the, the governor has all the power, but uh, as you mentioned, it, it affects you know, the state finances and uh, the economy and uh, which you will have to deal with uh, in the legislature, right? Yes, but at this point, the governor and the mayors in their recommendation are going back to the gathering uh, sizes of 10 indoors and 25 outdoors, 50% capacity in the restaurants. And when Oahu was in tier two, uh, as you recall, you know, they were were in tier one, they were still at five people indoors and outdoors. And uh, so, you know, they in the current executive order, they're hoping to take a more balanced approach to try and see if we can't get our uh, health numbers in a better place without a complete shutdown of the economy. The other thing is that the governor and the mayors have still decided to continue to keep safe travels uh, in place where trans-Pacific travelers with uh, proof of vaccination are not uh, you know, subject to quarantine or if you use a trusted partner 72 hours before you travel and get a negative test result, then you are uh, you know, still eligible or you know, not required to quarantine. And of course, uh, in some of the confusion, you need to load your material onto the Safe Travels app uh, or get it done before you travel and print out your QR code to ensure that uh, you, know, you would not be subject to quarantine. And so that's a significant decision on their part, although uh, in the presentation we got from General Hara last week, Thursday to the Senate's COVID-19 committee, 85% of all of the positives are residents and 15% are visitors. And, uh, you know, certainly Hawaii residents enjoy vacationing in Las Vegas. And quite a few of the infections are occurring with uh, Hawaii residents who have traveled to Las Vegas on vacation, have contracted COVID in Las Vegas and then brought it back home. Um, yeah. Well, uh, you mentioned, you know, the tourists versus the residents. Of course, they could be transmitting it. And as you mentioned, they're, they're, uh, when our residents go to on trips and return with it. Um, so that's still going back to the governor or is it the uh, Adjutant General's uh, decision. And they're making these decisions in consultation with the Department of Health. I haven't seen a memo yet when the COVID-19 committee hopes to reconvene. You know, they went through uh, the superintendent uh, or interim superintendent of schools. They had General Hara and, uh, you know, a few other uh, Hilton Ratio had given a health update, but they ran out of time and didn't get to the Department of Health. So I think our community and the members of the Senate are certainly interested in hearing uh, the report from the Department of Health. But all of these decisions are made with the Adjutant General, uh, the Health Department, and of course, the consultation of the mayors. As we know on Kauai back in December, Mayor Kawakami chose to opt out of safe travel. So any of the mayors still have the option of requesting to the governor to opt out of safe travels. But right now, uh, you know, everybody is in the program. And, uh, you know, that was in the joint statement from the governor and the mayors yesterday. Yeah, you know, still stuck on tourism. 
you know, it, it's a big uh, economic engine, as they call it. Uh, when we had the shutdown, state were starving, you know, hotels, businesses, a lot of them closed. And now when it's opened up, it's uh, overtroped. So what is the solution? Well, one of the solutions, and it was piloted on Kauai, is the reservation system to now get to KA Beach. Back in April of 2018, when we had the catastrophic flooding and uh, part of the North Shore got cut off because the bridge washed out, finally created the opportunity for people to say, we're going to limit uh, the visitors to KA at 900 a day. We were getting upwards of two or 3,000 a day. You know, they were parked all over the place. An emergency vehicle couldn't get to the end of the road if there was some kind of medical emergency. And you need to pay if you're a visitor for that uh, parking and the reservation to go to the beach. They uh, took that to Wainapanapa on Maui. Uh, the Ways and Means Committee in 2019 visited KA to see what was going on. So Senator English put that in place. Uh, Wainapanapa between a $20 parking pass for a vehicle and $5 entry fee per individual is scheduled <clears throat> to make $3.5 million this year. They just started at Diamond Head and Diamond Head generated just under $400,000 in its first month of operation. You know, we're looking at Koke'e and uh, other state parks throughout the state for uh, assessing uh, parking fees and visitor entry passes. And this could generate upwards of 40 to $50 million, but also would give us an opportunity to manage how many people can uh, actually access the resource and give us an opportunity to better manage the resource by limiting the amount of people who go there. And with the money being generated, it gives us the revenue to reinvest into the natural resources. I, I think that's, you know, uh, one faction of it, or one part. Uh, and again, you have some of the local guys who live there. You know, they kind of get their water heater fixed. You know, it called me to do a job. And I'm reluctant to go out there to do it, you know, because all the shutdowns and uh, it, um, there's more to it than, you know, just that one piece, right? Yes, but that is the uh, first step in how we manage it. I mean, we still have uh, general issues. The airport is controlled by the FAA, which is uh, federally controlled, so we cannot really stop planes from coming in. We don't control the private uh, market, so what the airlines decide to sell the seats for is critically important. And then uh, when you take a look at um, what the hotel rooms or other accommodations are going for, all of those factor into the attractiveness of whether they're going to click the button to go to Hawaii or to go to somewhere else. And you know what is uh, certainly something we're closely monitoring, this is with almost no foreign visitors. This is almost all domestic travel. OK, yeah. Um, OK, we touched a little bit on the uh, finances. Uh, can you discuss? state finances, where, where do we go from here? Well, we, um, I guess what is really misleading is that the Council of Revenues, when COVID first hit and we shut the airport, had a minus 14% growth. And Hawaii and Nevada are the two largest service economies with hotels and restaurants. And so it's been the biggest challenge for us to uh, get back to a healthier economic path. So as the numbers have gotten better, people are asking me, what are you gonna do with all of the surplus? Well, we don't really have a surplus. They finally went from minus two in the last report to plus two. And when they said we had $600 million more 
to spend next year than was anticipated. In the budget we adopted, we uh, generally pay $500 million to the health fund and the retirement system. And we did that this year, but we did not make that payment next year. So of that 600 million, the first 500 million will go to pay our obligation in uh, the health and the pension fund. And then we had to use all of our rainy day fund. And so a lot of that 100 million really should go back to the rainy day fund so that we're prepared when the next catastrophe hits. And who knows the way the Delta variant has been spreading, we may be in the next new catastrophe right now. So we've relied a lot on uh, federal, federal money going to people and they, they're gonna pay taxes on it, right? Yes. Uh, and you know, uh, we mentioned uh, like things opening up, but we get problems with employees and the uh, housing. Uh, was that the, the uh, you cannot uh, kick out the tenants, right? I I would not say kick out. There is an eviction <laughs> moratorium. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, you're politically correct. <laughs> but that's why you're there and I'm not. Uh, as we've discussed before, your uh, SAT scores were very high. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, that uh, you got to look at all those things. And uh, people have, uh, businesses have a hard time finding uh, employees. So, you know, they get to close some days or shut uh, the doors early. Uh, what do you got to say about that? I, I, all I have to say is it's challenging. Uh, Ways and Means, were, were, they were on Kauai visiting a few weeks ago. And the real question we had is, what are the programs we need to put in place in K through 12 to start better training our uh, students as they graduate to be workforce ready where are the jobs where is the need and uh, you know hopefully we're going to do a better job of delivering the education there to get a better workforce in the near term it is simply going to be a problem finding workers we have had people because of the cost of living who have simply left Kauai and gone to other areas where the cost of living is less. And uh, we don't have as many people here as we used to in, uh, in the workforce. And then uh, the unemployment benefits do not run out until next month. So we still have people who are being uh, you know, paid that uh, added benefit on the unemployment. And uh, you know, I think if the unemployment benefits run out in September, then maybe, you know, you'll see more people who are going to resume going into the workforce. And, uh, you know, I, I get that there are those who are reluctant to go back to work, who are concerned about their health and their safety. And, you know, we need to just work uh, to, or to continue to strive to make people feel confident and comfortable that they can resume uh, working uh, and uh, that they're gonna do so in a way that's safe. I would be remiss if I didn't take the time to say I would still encourage anyone who does not have an allergy or other adverse reaction to the vaccination, getting vaccinated is the most powerful way that we can fight uh, the COVID-19 variants. And it is the best way that we can try to get people safe and hopefully uh, get to a point where people can resume more normal activities in their lives in a safe way. Yeah, thanks. I'm um, getting back to housing. We all look at the median price, climb higher and higher to million dollars now for a single family home. Um, you know, granted, the county and the state doing a lot of work on the lower end than a quote affordable, which you know, is just a word affordable because 
you know, the prices of uh, houses in that range, it goes up pretty high. Um, I, I think uh, the government could do more in, you know, for the middle-class working people as far as housing, and, you know, to make it more available to them, then they'll have to do less on the lower end. Any uh, comment on that? Well, no, I, I agree with you, Dennis, and I know that you have represented uh, the island of Kauai on state boards dealing with housing throughout the state and are very well versed in, on this subject. Uh, when uh, D.R. Horton opened those homes next to King Kamuali'i School in Hanama'ulu at 400,000 or so, people were screaming, you know, it's not affordable, it's not affordable. Uh, the low end affordable for that rezoning project had been built at Kalepa Village many years ago. So they did have the 80 and below or 65 and below units built. Uh, for those who aren't aware of the numbers that we use, 100,000 is a median income for a couple of two. And uh, at this point, you know, at 80%, your combined income cannot exceed $80,000. Right now, if you've been teaching for a few years, you're making 50,000 plus. You know, a husband and wife or a teacher, they exceed $100,000 in income and they can't afford to buy a house. A uh, police officer starts at about 65, 70,000 like a firefighter does. All of a sudden we have people who are teaching our children and first line responders, nurses as well. If they're a married couple who are priced out of the affordable market, and I completely agree with you that we need to have some of these units that are in place. And then for those who are able to purchase those DR Horton homes where we see the market today, you know, though that would have been a really great investment on their part. And uh, you know, to get into a home at 400, 450 dollars compared to today's market, uh, you know, really, really would have done well. We're in a worldwide marketplace. We have more people because of the safety numbers in Hawaii and Kauai in particular, buying sight unseen million dollar properties to work remotely. Uh, you know, that global market is one we'll continue to compete in and uh, I wholeheartedly agree that we need to have units available to, uh, you know, our white collar workers and, and first line responders who are there protecting us each and every day. Yeah. The, the phrase you mentioned, sight unseen, we hear that all the time now, you know, guys buying it. I hear for guys putting their uh, homes on the market and they get offers uh, bidding wars and getting a lot more than what they asked for or was listed for. Uh, yeah, we got to, I think, you know, we got to do that uh, with leadership from the top, up down. Uh, you know, but the other thing when people said, let's go cap the uh, prices, but for someone who invested 20, 30 years ago into a house, and envision that as their retirement, as a rental, the mortgage is paid off. All of a sudden, uh, you know, when they're offered that million dollar price for the house, how do you tell that person who's 60, 70 years old, don't, don't sell your house, don't make a profit? I mean, you know, they sacrificed a lot to, to get it. And there are quite a bit of people who are age 60 and older that uh, investing in uh, you know, rental properties was a comfortable investment strategy, one that they could see, touch, and they were familiar with. You know, there are people who are uncomfortable in the stock market, and, and that's all part of the challenge. I mean, it's not just rich people getting richer. They're, you know, they're offering this kind of dollars for old plantation homes. Yeah, no, that's, you know, that's not what I'm saying to do, you know. Um, well, there have been well, uh, yeah, that yeah, yeah, and yeah, it, it's one of the things they talk about. But I'm thinking, uh, like all the things that a quote uh, developer, although that word is kind of a bad name, um, 
has to go to land use change, all the permitting, and it takes years to do it, you know, and which equates to money. Well, uh, the other, yeah. But the other thing, Dennis, I, I think that still, you know, the, the biggest or best point that you've made is so much of our focus is on 80 and below or with the 9% tax credit, 65 and yeah. below that yeah. we are not paying enough attention to those in that 100 to 140 percent group and while it may seem like it's not affordable yeah. to sell that high yeah. these are our friends and neighbors who uh, are making over a hundred thousand dollars a year as a as a couple but they can't pay a million dollars you know for that market home yeah. and so we need to see things in that in that price range so we are committing a lot of state resources for rental assistance, but we're also committing money uh, in the development revolving fund. And we're trying to help look at financing interim uh, construction uh, costs for infrastructure and partnering with the counties across, excuse me, across the state to try and build more of these affordable units. Okay, thanks. We got uh, several minutes left. Um, what, what topic that comes up very so often is gambling in a way. Uh, wanna elaborate on your thoughts on that? Uh, I'm, I'm not somebody who supports gaming and certainly pre-pandemic, I enjoy going to uh, Las Vegas and playing video poker and, you know, wagering on, on uh, sports events uh, at the sports book, but uh, at, at this point, I think we can solve our problems without uh, gambling. Uh, the other one that's going to be, I, I believe, uh, you know, uh, top of the list again next session is the legalization of marijuana as another method of uh, raising revenue. And, uh, you know, personally, I've not been a big proponent of marijuana, but I can tell you that an overwhelming majority of my caucus in the Senate support it, and I'm aware of, uh, you know, how they feel, and so I, I'm sure that this is going to be something that will be widely debated next year. Okay, but see, if we had gambling here, then guys don't have to go to Las Vegas and bring back the COVID. <laughs> Well, I have no uh, argument to refute. That <laughs> no, I, and um, I mean one uh, one thing the DHHL was talking about gambling in on their property. I know you had some thoughts on that. But. Uh, again, it's not something that I was supportive of, but my uh, Hawaiian Affairs Chair, Senator Shimabukuru. Senator Keo Kaloli, uh, who's the chair of the Hawaiian caucus in the legislature, they wanted to uh, hear what the thoughts were and they had asked for a hearing and I supported them proceeding to try and get the information. But in the end, uh, Chair Shimabukuro did not have the support of her committee to move the bill along after the hearing was held. So what, uh, what was the plan or the discussion about on that? Uh, it was that they were going to dedicate the funding to uh, the Department of Hawaiian Homelands for the development of housing for their beneficiaries. And that's what the intended use of the revenue was going to be. So I don't mean to deflect on the gambling yeah. uh, issue. I've said clearly it's not something that I support, but I just know there's more support in the Senate caucus for legalization of marijuana than to consider legalized gambling at this point. Our time uh, went by really fast. Uh, Ron, thanks for joining us. Any closing words? No, just thank you for the opportunity to continue to connect with uh, everyone out there and appreciate the invitation and uh, happy to do it uh, sometime in the future if you run out of new guests. Thanks again, Senator Ron Tochi. Thank you to uh, Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, see you again in a couple of weeks. Aloha and mahalo.